start it off right by magnifying Jesus. If I could just get, let's just lift our hands. Let's close our eyes. He's worthy. He's worthy. He's worthy. Mm. God, we fix our eyes on you and you alone. We've come, Father, with no greater expectation in the face of Jesus. This week is about you, God. Mm. We become very aware of your presence right now. God, I thank you that you're in the room. You never left the room. You just want us to be aware that you're here. God, I exalt you. I thank you, God, for who you are and who you've called me to be. God, I thank you that this week you are raising revival in a people. A people that aren't having prayer meetings about revival, but a people that have become the very essence of revival a people that are not ashamed of this beautiful gospel. God, I pray for one thing and one thing alone, that we draw closer to your presence. And as we get closer to you, God, that we can't help but to spill Jesus everywhere that we go. God, we love you. Can you guys guys give God praise really quick? And you guys can be seated. Thank you so much. Just like one more minute. It's just beautiful. I think it helps it go down better. It's just, I'm so honored to be here with David Wally and David Wilson, the two Davids. And and I just want to honor Pastor Pete and Debbie and Pastor Roy and Pastor Petey and Chris Kostrove and all of the amazing men that we've had a chance to have fellowship with so far. We're honored that you guys would have us and um, we just love Jesus and I just want to love Jesus in front of you tonight. Is that okay? Um, I really believe that, you know, I kind of prepared something, but I just don't think there's any better way to minister than just to minister to the heart of God and just bring you guys into it with me. Is that okay? So I'm really excited for what God's going to do this week. I, um, just a little bit about me again. My name is William. We have a, a ministry in Dallas called Risen Nation. And uh, I've never known anything but church and ministry. I'm a pastor's kid, um, but had to make a decision for myself. And, uh, you know, my, my uncle is a large evangelist and goes all over the world. And uh, some people like him, some people don't, but it's okay. And uh, <clears throat> I've had an opportunity to work for a lot of men of God and see God do a lot of things. And uh, I just, I'm honored to be with you guys. And so this week, we're going to just go after Jesus, okay? And we're not just going to hear the word, and that's it. We're going to hear the word and do the word. And we're going to go out. And how many of you have, like, ever stepped out before and prayed for someone in public? Just raise your hand high. Come on, praise God. Well, it's going to get really intense. And I believe that we are going to see the supernatural break down in these streets. It's not just reserved for the church, but it's like we got to take this word out. It says in James that those that hear the word and don't do the word are like men looking in the mirror and just seeing themselves look back at them. But my Bible says that behold in the mirror the glory of God. So you'll never fully walk into what God, who God has created you to be unless you not only hear the word, but you actually walk out a life worthy of the word. I don't want to just come to church once a week and get a good message and encouragement and then go live life Monday through Saturday looking nothing different than the world. I want Monday through Saturday to be a life that has become the church. That what if, what if the church was a kitchen where we cooked a really good meal together and delivered it to the world? What if the church was more than, like what if we added to the church daily like we saw in Acts? You know, there's a statistic that I read. You can look it up online. It says that 96 to 99% of church growth today is people going from one church to another church. 
I don't know if God looks from heaven and goes, my bride. So what would it look like if the church was out of two daily because people were getting pulled up off streets and in their workplace and in the marketplace and it's not about a building it's it's about people becoming the building of God it's not about ministry it's about becoming a ministry like you can't debate a life the Bible says that the kingdom of God doesn't come and talk but in power if I can talk you into the gospel you could probably be talked out But if you can encounter Jesus through my life that's surrendered to him and you try to put the needle in and it doesn't work, you can't debate that. You know, I was talking to Brother Charles today. He's telling me his testimony about God set him free in a moment from drugs. A moment. All the desire left when he became born again. Never touched it again. What is that? You can't debate that life. You can't debate the fact that he's different. You can't debate the fact that he has no desire to do drugs again. And I believe that that's what God is looking to raise in the earth is people's lives, people's lives looking like Jesus. Where it's not just talk, but it's a life that burns for him. Amen. You know, today, like I said, 96, 99% just going from one place to another. You know, oftentimes I think it's so easy that life just becomes about our preferences. What's closest to where we live, best children's church? Where do I get the best, best visitors packet at? I promise you that people's lives, people desire their lives to be changed, their families to be transformed, kids to be healed, kids to be free from drugs and addiction and alcohol more than a good visitors packet. And you know what I felt when I walked in? I felt a healthy, alive church. You guys are hungry. And I'm telling you, God will always honor hunger. Always. You guys are prime. You're ready. I just desire that all this event be is be let's go. It's time to go. I believe that, you know, this building is a miracle. I heard the testimony of it's a promise, but it's not going to last for very long. So you're not going to fit in it very long. Like, what if the whole thing just became a youth center or a school and, uh, and you just had to get a bigger place because so many people were coming to the gospel through your life? What would this city look like? So I'm really excited for this week and we're going to go out and we're going to bring the gospel and it's going to be amazing. But I really believe in three things and, and as we teach... We are going to give you tools of evangelism and testimonies and things that we've seen God do in our lives and through people's lives that are just willing to surrender on a constant basis and just live a life that's worthy of the call. But I really believe in three things, and I would hate to send you out without you knowing who you are. I would hate to send you out without you ever getting time and spending time with Jesus. You know, so often we just fit him into our schedule. We talk to him on the way to work. You know, we set the alarm for six, but then we hit snooze 17 times. Sorry, God. You know, I think sometimes we, we've, it's like when I was in high school before Christ, my BC days, you know, you see a girl, you like the idea of being in a relationship with her, but then you actually get into a relationship with her and it's not what you expected. Just, I'm going to be really straightforward and honest and, and it's just going to be fun, okay? So just listen, silence belongs in the grave. All right, so I need you to talk back. We're going to go after this thing, okay? But you get into a relationship with someone and it was like just a good idea of a relationship until you actually dove into it. I think we do that with God in the church. I think we love the idea of being intimate with God. I think we love the idea of living a life that's worthy I think we love the idea of never touching sin again. I think we love the idea of stepping out on a daily basis and seeing the sick healed, seeing the lame walk, seeing the demonic flee when we walk into. I think we love the idea of all of it and we could preach about all of it, but when the alarm goes off at 5 a.m., is it still a good idea? We go into the secret place and we go there so we can get something from God. 
when we actually do go. Or when we actually have the time to talk to him and spend time with him. Or maybe we take the 10 minutes on the way to work. What are you talking to him about? So often, and I'm not here to to correct. or I'm just, this is my own life. This is my own experience. This is what God did in my heart. Is that okay? Because I found myself going after God for what I could get from him. And it's nothing more than prostitution. Oh, we're going to go for it, okay? I went into my closet to see what I could get from him, and that's called professional intimacy. But you see, God, and I'm going to give you guys a couple of stories and testimonies in my life that God spoke to me through, but there is a place with God where you can walk into the closet knowing fully who you are in Christ, which we're going to talk about, and ministering to his heart on a daily basis. Like, what if you never had to go to God again for your need because we believe the word that says he will supply all of our needs? What if it was a wasted prayer? Like, I've never gone to God and said, God, I I need you to get me this house. I need you to get me this car. It's just there because it's in the need category. But my father wants to know what's the desires of my heart. You know, when I was little, I never begged my dad for toilet paper. It was always there faithful toilet paper never even thought about it as a kid never thought about paper towels I, my mom was so good I never even thought about laundry as a little kid never thought about what we we're going to eat for dinner God thank God I know people do have to think about that stuff but God took care of my need but how much different is it when I go to if I went to my dad and I said listen in my culture we call him Bubba and I said Bubba and I got on my knees I beg you I need toilet paper. Or I got in front of my fridge and got on my knees and begged him to let me open it and get some food out. My dad would slap me and say, son, have you forgotten who you are? My fridge is your fridge. My house is your house. We go to God and we try to get something from him and beg on, bang on the front door trying to let us in. He goes, have you forgotten who you are and who I've called you to be? My house is your house. That would be weird. But how much more joy did my natural dad get out of me bringing a Christmas list to him and being able to bless his child and give to his child? Like, I feel like some of you guys need to hear this. Just even the principle of there's needs in your life, I understand. There is specific things that people in this room are going to God about contending for. And I'm here to tell you that it's done. It's done. You don't need to beg God. It's his good pleasure to give you everything. He's already given it to you, all things pertaining to life and to godliness. He finished you before he started you. So we don't need to go into the secret place begging for God to come and show up in our lives and do stuff. I can go into the secret place and tell God how amazing he is and minister to his heart and we'll be, there'll be a deep calling unto deep and we'll be delighted just to be in each other's presence and I'll leave and it'll be actual intimacy. I know that there's some kids in here, but it's okay because they need to know. But I'm married. I have a 14-month-old little boy. They're probably watching. Hi, babe. And, uh, and a little girl on the way. So I'm pretty excited. I don't know how to like, I'm pretty nervous because I don't know what girls wear. And I'm going to make her wear a turtleneck every day of her life. <laughs> Especially with the way our generation's going. God have mercy. But you know, as a husband, the greatest pleasure I get is when I please my wife. And every husband will understand that, a husband that truly loves their wife. You see, we are the bride of Christ. The greatest joy that we should get is be pleasing to him. Not getting stuff from him. You know, we desire him for his power, but what if we just desired him and power was a result? What would that look like? It would look like an overflow called evangelism. (laughs) All right. I believe in three things. I was saying I believe in identity. When we come into the knowing of who we are, we get born again. We understand that we are a child of God. We understand that the only reason I came is just to love him. I didn't give my life to the Lord to get to some mansion someday in heaven. I gave my life to the Lord to get possessed 
by heaven every day. Because John 17 says that this is eternal life that I may know you. It doesn't say that this is eternal life. One day you will die and go to heaven. Do you know that nowhere in this Bible does it say that you have to die to go to heaven? Correct me if I'm wrong, but it doesn't say that anywhere. And if I'm wrong, look, listen, don't listen to me. Look in the book for yourself. But I promise you, you won't find death being a crown and an entrance into heaven. Because if it was just about dying and go to heaven, we should just all die. That doesn't make sense. Death is an enemy. That's why Jesus raised the dead. That's why you're supposed to raise the dead. <clears throat> oh, but you see, we've made it all about getting to a location someday called heaven. We've preached a gospel of fear to keep people out of hell, but Jesus, my Jesus, is so much more than a fire escape from hell. I didn't marry my wife because she had a nice house. I married my wife because I fell in love with her. It's about communion. It's about knowing him. It's about coming into intimacy with him. So when you come into the knowing, this is number one, knowing who we are in Christ and knowing who he is to us and that identity, it leads to intimacy. I got married and immediately I experienced intimacy and I got flesh on flesh and we became one flesh. And then from that, there is this thing called an overflow. My life, knowing who I am in Christ and coming into intimacy with God, that mixture creates a life that spills over with Jesus. And then praying for people in public doesn't become a doing, it becomes a being. It comes out of a life with him. Where I'm so in love with him, how could I not say anything? What else is there to talk about? You know, we go and we talk with people, we talk about sports and the World Cup and we make idols out of everything. People crying when their team loses, people need Jesus. What is that? Like when I really got surrendered, people were like, how are your team doing, man? I, and I'm sorry, this is going to bother a lot of people, I feel like, in this area. I don't know really fully what's going on. I'm not saying it's bad to watch. Go for it. That's fine. But like, I, I love Jesus. Like, what if we filled stadiums and people shouted and cheered as loud as they did for their football team for Jesus? <clears throat> you know, we say, oh, it's stepping out in public. That's reserved for the evangelists. That's a lie from hell to keep you bound. If you're a son, it's hard to not look like your father. It's actually impossible. Like, it would be weird if I looked any different. My dad would need to talk to my mom. <laughs> there, you can't help but to reveal him when you're in love with him. You can't help but to look like him when you realize you're his seed. It's actually impossible, and it doesn't make any sense. I was baptized in the Holy Ghost to be a witness. I wasn't baptized in the Holy Ghost so I can fall on the ground every week in church and then have no fruit in my life. Listen, I've seen it my whole life. My testimony is simply this. I grew up in church my whole life. I saw ministry my whole life. I saw stadiums filled my whole life. And I ran for ministry. I, I've had no desire to preach till today. I just want Jesus because I've seen it all. I ran from it and somehow I found my way behind this thing again. But you know what I saw a lot of? People go to church, they thank God, praise God, fall out, tremble, and then they go home and they curse out their wife and they've got issues. Listen, there is a place. We are going to encounter God this week. And there's going to be some stuff that you haven't seen before, I promise. There might be some bodies on the floor. There might be some demons that are fleeing. It's all amazing. Probably not, though, because, I mean, look at Pastor Pete here. <laughs> demons stay far from this building. They do. Come on, man. They do. <laughs> One day I will be as big as you are. 
not just, can we just be family? It's just fun. I don't even know what I was saying. There's a pick here, actually. You know, but I saw people fall out. I saw people encounter God and come up bearing no fruit. And there's a place for encounter, but it's not encounter to encounter to encounter. It's you encounter him and you become a living encounter. You actually learn to live, move, and have your being in him on a constant basis. And then God will come, but when he comes, it's not to rejuvenate you again, it's to increase you. You know that there's no such thing in this Bible that says process? You know what it does say is it says increase. It's not glory to glory to glory, it's glory to glory to glory. Like what if we could be free from issues? What if we could be free from bad days? It'd be the gospel. Like what if the person cut me off on the road but because I'm so in love with God and I've become love, I can't help but to just praise God for that person. You know what happened to me this week in Southern Orange County, California? I got, I, I accidentally, you know, cut a guy off. It was honest to God. You know what this guy did? He's probably a Christian. Listen, statistics show it. He flew around me, and man, this guy showed me a bird. <laughs> For a good two minutes, my wife was so hurt by it, and I said, Jesus, bless him. You know, like, what if traffic wasn't a bummer, but an opportunity to just be with Jesus more? You, some of you think this guy is weird, man. He's talking fairy tale. There is a place with God where you're always on a honeymoon. I believe, I believe in the rest of God. When I'm, listen, we're in a rush to get nowhere. We're rushed to get in, we're rushed to get out. What are you gonna do when you get home? <clears throat> I think when we rush in, we rush out, it insults his glory, actually. And so, I, you know what God spoke to me the other day? He said, I know that I'm scattered. It's gonna be like this all week. It's gonna be fun, okay? You know what the Lord said to me this week is he goes, <clears throat> he goes, so many rush in, rush out and insult my glory and keep themselves from encountering me because they confine me to their time. And I said, oh God. And then I just stayed there for a long time. He's worth your time. He's worth your surrender. Like what if God came to you and said, the greatest call I have, you'll never leave a cubicle, but I'll be with you there. Is it enough for you? This burns in my heart so much for my generation, this one thing right here. I see people everywhere. You know, they look at my life. I work for, you know, a big evangelist. They think, wow, that's great. You get to travel. You get to do this. You get to do that. And everyone wants to build their own ministry. And everyone wants to be the most anointed. Everyone wants to have a church. Complain about their job. God blesses them with something. They complain about it. Take that gift. Hand it to the devil and expect everything to be okay. Because we pray for jobs, we pray for provision, God gives you one and then you complain about it. And just, you're no different than the Israelites. You're gonna circle, you're gonna go in a circle. But especially in young people today, everyone looking for their calling, everyone looking for their purpose, everyone looking for their destiny. And my Bible says in Romans 8, 29, that those he foreknew, he predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. That changed my life. I was working in a warehouse in Dallas and I was packing boxes on an assembly line, the same box every day. And I just had moved from Southern Orange County where there was mountains and I could go snowboarding and surfing all in the same day. For a kid my age, that was amazing. It was the dream. And then God said, go to Texas. Well, he didn't say it to me. He said it to my dad, but I really honor my dad. So I just went and my dad started a church and it was flat and hot. It was a pizza oven. And then I got a job in a warehouse and where I worked, there was an AC inside of it. And not a lot of people spoke English and I thought, oh my Lord, what am I doing here? And you know what the Lord did? Is he filled me with himself every day. And I got happier and happier about the box, the same box came, but I was so happy about it every time because I fell in love with him. And when you actually do everything in word or deed unto the Lord, like Colossians 3.17 says, nothing in this world can take your joy from you because the joy of the Lord is my strength. And if things in this world are able to take my joy, they're taking my God and you just can't do it. 
So I had an encounter with God in this, in this warehouse that changed my life forever. But you know, the ambition for ministry was never there, ever, I can honestly say it. But I watched my generation today go after God for the sake of what's to come because they want to be used by Him. Going after ministry. We're not supposed to go after ministry. He didn't tell Moses, Moses, start Moses International Ministries. He called him to the children of Israel. He called him to people. Like, I, I never pray God use me. I just want to be so close to him that I become a tool in his hand. You see, but we get so caught up in what we can do for God rather than just being with God and becoming like God that we can sit in the secret place. And if I'm able to sit in the secret place, look around his face and desire some deeper calling, I've missed it. Because what my Bible says is those he foreknew, he predestined to be conformed to him. And it's what that verse, I read that in the warehouse and it changed my life. Because I realized that I wasn't packing the boxes and doing this, you know, hoping for a better day. I didn't give my life to God hoping for a better day. When we give our lives to God, we become the hope in the midst of every day. My expectation is not in the world and what the world can give me and what the world can offer me. You know what I expect from the world? Persecution. The world has nothing else to offer you. It has nothing for you. There's nothing for you in the world. But when Jesus comes, my expectations go from desiring something from the world and the world supplying for me and helping me to God supplying for me and God being my expectation and God being the promise. The world's going to stay the same, but I'm not. And then I'm going to go into the world, and my world is going to change. We have to become hope in the midst of the day. We don't give our lives to him and expect everything to get better. Sometimes it gets worse. You know, like God promises you a building. We were talking about in the car, and then you wait seven years. And then you have to work on it for 18 months. Like he, David, we were talking about David's like, you know, Paul didn't have an easy life. No. If you're expecting things to get easier, you're, you're deceived. But you see that there is, a, there is a joy and a love that's beyond understanding. There's a way with God where everything can be crashing down around you, where nothing makes sense but God. But I know him and I love him and he, he makes my heart Flutter with joy every time I think about him. This is how we overcome the world, is our faith in God, not our faith in what my boss can give me. And when we realize that in Romans 8, 29, that before the world was, he gave me a destiny. Before the world was, he gave me a purpose. He saw me. And he said that purpose and that destiny is simply to be conformed to the Son, Jesus. When you come into an understanding that there is nothing greater than the face of Jesus, you're going to stop striving. You're going to stop striving at your job. You're going to stop striving to go after ministry. You're going to stop striving to do the outreach. And you're just going to look at the face of Jesus and go, God, if you put me in the cubicle for the rest of my life, if you put me in a janitor's closet for the rest of my life, and I get to look at your face, I'm going to be a okay and I'm going to be filled with joy because I'm looking at the face of God. No more prostitution. No more professional intimacy going to God for what we can get from Him. But what if we went to God because we just loved Him? And we want to be like Him. When I go to the store, I'm just going to look like Him. And I'm not going to have to work for it. I'm going to be in love with Him. Like, I don't go to the grocery store going... Who can I pray for in here? I go there to get groceries. And in the midst of getting groceries and being in love with God, I can't help to love other people. And I get the opportunity to love every single person in front of me. Listen, people are not an obligation. People are a pleasure. Listen, we go and we say, oh, I've got to do it. I've got to pray. I've got to get this many people today. We write down, we want to go to people so and pray for them and so we can get good testimonies to share at church. When God wants you to become the testimony, 
God wants you to go to the store and not have to like build up courage to pray for the sick, but to be so lost in him that your courage and your faith becomes his courage and his faith. Listen, the news is, is that you are not going to heal anyone this week. You are not going to lay hands on anyone this week. You're going to bring Jesus there. It's as simple as that. And you don't have to stress about it. He's good and faithful, and he always shows up when he's more important than they are. It changed my life. All right, I'm going to actually, like, do something specific now. So the Lord's been speaking to me this week about identity, intimacy, and the overflow, which we're going to do. We're going to actually step out starting tomorrow. I'm so excited that David's here. This kid is like a, you can't, you're talking to him, and then you turn around, and then he's gone, and he's praying for someone in a wheelchair, just burning for the Lord. And so we're going to go out, and we're going to see God do a lot of things, but I need us to remember that it's simply not about the outreach. It's about him. It's not about praying for the sick and seeing the sick recover. It's about him touching the sick and seeing the sick recover. And we're not going to go out as employees for God. We're going to go out as children of God. He doesn't need you to do anything for him. He's, he's, he'll be okay. He just wants you to be like him every day. It's as simple as that. And so specifically with identity, and you guys can just listen, but in Romans 6 and Ephesians 2, there's six specific things, and I appreciate it. You're good. Thank you. See, it felt good. It was perfect. It was perfect. The anointing is just perfect. There's six things that Jesus specifically did for us on the cross. I'm not at all the six-point teacher or preacher. Um, I so admire and honor people like Pastor Pete and my dad, even my dad's a pastor. You know, they do these series and they find fresh manna every week. I'm like, I'm doing good to just make sense and stay on one topic. So it's, it's amazing to me, men that have depth in the word and can go after it, and I highly honor it. But, so I'm not the six-point teacher, but there is six actual things you read in Scripture about what Jesus did on the cross for us. And I have news is he didn't just die for you, he died as you. And that might shake you a bit, but I'll prove it. So just go home and open your Bible, because I don't have time to read it all. Read Romans 6 and read Ephesians 2. We're going to be in that portion of Scripture a lot this week. But throughout that, you see that six things happen. It says that when he was crucified, we were crucified. It's number one. Number two, when he died, we died. I'm not saying anything that I've come up with. This is all in the Bible. Romans 6, Ephesians 2, Colossians 2 is another book. In chapter that says the same thing. So number one, when he was crucified, we were crucified. Number two, when he died, we died. Number three, when he was buried, we were buried. Number four, when he was quickened, we were quickened, which means that in the point in the grave where the spirit quickened the body of Jesus, it actually means so much more than that. It was the moment where God and man, it says that they fused in the Greek together. So when he was quickened, we were quickened with him. When he was raised, it says that we were raised. And here's my favorite one, number six. When he was seated in heavenly places, we were seated in heavenly places. And now listen, it doesn't say that one day I'm going to be seated in heavenly places. It's now. Salvation is now. God's love for you is now. The identity of Christ in you, the hope of glory, is now. Because it's none of this is, you know what's interesting, is everything that's past tense for Jesus is past tense for us. Huh. But what's present for Jesus, being seated now in heavenly places, he says that we're with him, seated in heavenly places. So he didn't just die for you on a cross, all of humanity hung there. And whether you know it or not, whether you're a Christian or not, you're dead and you need to come alive. You know, I heard my dad one time give this example and it, and it was amazing. 
But what was the number one temptation that Jesus dealt with? It was always against his identity. If you be the son of God, cast yourself off of the cliff here, off the temple mount, surely says that the angels will catch you. If you be the son of God, just turn this stone into bread. If you be the son, Jesus is hanging on a cross and there's two thieves next to him. And on one side, you have a man saying, forgive me. And he says, I'm gonna see you in paradise. A lot like mankind, constantly repenting, asking for forgiveness. And then on the other side, you have a thief that sounds a lot like the devil saying, same thing, if you be the son of God, get us off of here. So on that day, I believe fully in my heart If you go deep into the word, Jesus was not the only one that died. The devil died too. He knew that he was doomed. I don't fight a devil anymore. The devil's defeated as far as my life is concerned. I believe with all of my heart when we come into the knowing and understanding of who we are in Christ and the authority that we carry because of him, when I walk into the room, hell gets out. And when you walk into the room, hell leaves. Because he died. He's defeated. You know, the church, I, I hear more about the devil in church than I do the world. And we give him such place and such authority when he actually doesn't have any. It says that he's like a roaring lion. He is a little mouse with a big microphone. He's not a lion. He's trying to be like the lion. But there's only one lion. Oh, come on. I don't go around my house rebuking the devil, stay away from my kids. None of that ever. I'm in the house. I'm in the city. I'm in the church. Jesus walked in and they trembled. They knew him better than all the other Pharisees knew him. He didn't just die for me, he died as me. And so on a cross, you have mankind Begging for forgiveness, I'll see you in paradise. You have the devil on the other side. If he be the son of God, and you have Jesus hanging on a cross. And all three died that day, all three of them. Man died with him, the devil defeated, done. No hope for him ever again, and Jesus died. But only one was raised, only one. And the only way that you're truly gonna come into a newness of life is coming through the son of God. You only can come up through Jesus. So we have a lot of people walking around as dead men. A lot of the world that doesn't know him that whether they believe it or not, he died for them too. They died with him too, whether they believe it or not. You know, when I gave my life to the Lord, it was, I remember specifically it was 2000 and and Jesus didn't die in 2000. Jesus actually died 2000 years ago for me. He thought of me before I ever even thought of him. He loved me before I ever even loved him. That's how I get to, that's why I get to love him. You know, like I heard a testimony one time. Imagine Jesus rocking you like a baby, telling you how much he loves you. How did you learn to talk? Because your parents spoke over you. I can't say I love you to God unless I know that he said it over me first. He taught me how to talk to him. Did you get that? There's only one way to life is you have to accept the fact that you died and you gotta die to self and all of the self-ambition, self-preservation that we have today and come alive through him. And when you come alive through God and you realize that everything he did on the cross was not just to get me to heaven, he died on a cross so that heaven could get inside of me and then you see Jesus pray in John 17 that this is eternal life, that they may know you, that God let them be one even as you and I are one. And he didn't say my father which art in heaven. He said our father which art in heaven. And when you realize that you are a child of God, that you were created for his good pleasure, when you were created for him and him alone and he loves you and the spirit of adoption hits your heart and you realize, God, I'm created in your image and I'm created in your likeness. And I get to not only represent you, it goes beyond that, I get to represent you to the world. When you realize that that sits your heart, everything's gonna change. You know, it's like it's simple and we hear it, but then we still have struggles in life and we deal with stress and we deal with discouragement. All of that is not in the new creation man. It doesn't belong to you. Being discouraged is illegal in the kingdom of God. 
Being stressed out is illegal in the kingdom of God. We were talking about it today. You have pastors everywhere carrying the burdens of people, stressed out, burnt out. I'm sorry, if you're burnt out and you need sabbaticals every month, what are you burning for? You're probably not burning for the right thing. We carry the burdens of people rather than just giving people to Jesus, the one who takes burdens away. We bear up people's sin, and all we're doing is enabling the sin. We call it listening. No, we need, you know what we need in the church? And God have mercy if that man does it because he's really big. We need men of God that are not ashamed and not afraid to confront sin. You know, Jesus, I'm sorry, God did not beat around bushes. He actually came through them and set them on fire. Hmm. I'm hungry for the standard to be raised in the church, desperately. But you know, it's, we've got to know who we are and we've got to know who he called us to be. And again, you're probably not going to hear a lot of like how to step out. How do, the Holy Spirit is a comforter for a reason. You got to get uncomfortable. Like if I taught you every step and what to say when you approach someone and how to do it, and we have no room for the Holy Spirit to do it. We have to know who we are. And we have to let it draw us to him. We have to love him most. You know how you love people most? You love him most. If you're like, God, how do I love people? I don't love people. If you're real honest with yourself. I struggle with people and the way they talk to me. It's about you. You know, we're like, I got an issue with this one. I've got an issue with that one. Guess what? You're the issue. And I don't care what they did or what they said. It's all over the church. You have drama everywhere. Not in this house, though. Thank God. You know, we're, we're a young group and like, this one said this, and there's gossip, and it's from hell. Right. And then, well, they, how could they say that about me? And then we get hurt by the church, and we go and wander off somewhere else, and we become part of the 96 to 99% looking for love rather than becoming love and plugging in somewhere. Wow. If you, Jesus lives in your heart, and you... Huh, and you can say that I've been born again. If you can say that the Holy Spirit has baptized me, that I'm in love with God, and still have an issue with someone, you don't know him. Because guess what? You have the capacity in you to fix it. If someone says a wrong word to me, it doesn't matter. They're only going to get love. If someone says something behind my back, it doesn't matter. God knows. Who cares? Like, the greatest thing I've ever, ever encountered in my life is realizing that I was set free from me. When I gave my life, I didn't, I didn't get set free from some devil. The devil was defeated. You know, like before I was burning for Jesus, I never thought about the devil, ever. I came to church and got scared of him. <laughs> when I gave my life, I got set free from me. And when I'm free from me, I'm free from you. And I don't care what you think. I just get to love you no matter what you think. We do all this stuff and listen, love doesn't hold record of wrong. Love bears all, believes all. You can lie to me a hundred times, but what the nature of God does in me is I wake up the next day with mercies made new and I believe the person every time they tell me because I believe the best. <laughs> We have family, there's people in here that have family members that you're struggling with. I just heard it in my heart. Family members that you're struggling with, people say this, people say that. They say this about my wife. It's not your issue. There's only one legal response in the kingdom, love. It's about becoming like him. It's as simple as that. As simple as that. So we're gonna keep going after identity and tomorrow we're going to talk about what it means to be free from sin, and it's going to be amazing. So, you know, honor your job, but at the same time, I just believe the night sessions are going to be good, but if you come to the afternoon and the morning, 
and actually do the thing and go out with it, your life is never going to be the same. I promise you. So identity and intimacy. So I just want to touch on intimacy really, really quick and just share a testimony about my life. I've never heard anything else. You know, I was talking about John 17 and, you know, eternal life not being locational but being relational. Knowing him is knowing eternity, which I can have right now. I don't have to wait to go to heaven. I can actually live in a realm called heaven. Because the reality is, is what is heaven? Well, it's the abode of God. But where does God live? In me. Where does it say that the kingdom is? It says it doesn't come by observation. It says it's in you. I can't look and find the kingdom somewhere. I have to look in the mirror. Beholding in the mirror the glory of God. It's all everything. God has given us all things. It says that as he is, so are we in this earth. It doesn't say that as he is, I'll be one day when I go to heaven. Glorified. It says that as he is, so am I in this world. It means right now. Once that truth hits your heart, it does something. And for me in my life, I never heard anything different. I grew up where my dad was persecuted for preaching that I'm not waiting for God to come and rescue me. I'm actually on a mission to fill the earth with God's glory. I'm not, I'm not sitting in the corner praying for revival. I actually go and walk in the streets and become revival. You know, we want God to just fall in the streets and people to get laid out and, and them to give their lives to the Lord, but you're in the city. Like how else is God heard and touched and felt and encountered? He's chosen you. That's why he came in a man named Jesus. He's always come through a man, always. Why? Because in the beginning in Genesis, it says that he had given us dominion, that he gave us all authority on the earth. It would be against his own jurisdiction to just come and do everything himself. He said that we have dominion, that we have authority, be fruitful and multiply, so God will always use a conduit of a man for him to be revealed is what he's chosen. And it's an amazing, amazing blessing and opportunity that's not to be taken lightly. If we could just see that God has chosen us to be revealed and just stay on that for the rest of our lives, you're gonna be okay. Like when I go to the store, literally walking in the similitude of God, just think on that for a minute. That the creator himself, literally all the galaxies, all the planets, everything in the universe, this universe that's constantly growing scientifically, all of it, is a speck in comparison to what's in you. Think about that for a second. Because the one who created all of it chose to make his home in me. He could have had a castle in the sky. He could have had a big mansion on a hill, and every time a little boy walked with his mommy, he'd say, Mommy, what's that? She'd say, That's where God lives. But mommy has to say God lives in you. That is, we can't receive it. It's actually cooler to have a mansion on a hill because we don't know him. But when it hits your heart that out of everything he chose to live, out of everywhere he chose, he said, I'm tired of living in temples. I'm tired of hiding in mountains. You're gonna become my temple. Oh, I'm gonna be the temple of the Holy Spirit. When it hits your heart, you run to him. Run to him. So I never have known anything else. I thought it was weird when people, this might, I don't know where you guys are at, but I have never, ever been taught that I'm a sinner. Ever. I've been taught that I'm a son of God and a child of the most high. And we're gonna get into it tomorrow and it's gonna be good. So even if that one thing makes you come back, do it. But the more I believe that I'm a sinner, the more I'm going to sin. But the more that I'm going to believe that, I, behold, all things have become new. I am a new creation in him. The more I believe that, the more I'm going to live like it. The more I'm going to be like it. But I grew up in a way of I wasn't waiting for some rapture. You know, it's the whole mindset of God, of needing God to come and rescue us is saying heaven with me and hell to everyone else. That is literally the opposite of the gospel. We pray for him to come and rescue us from all of our problems. What are we doing? 
He needs to come into our hearts and become a rescuer out of us like a roaring lion. So I never knew anything else, and I thought it was weird. I went to a, a high school that was pretty intense denomination and was not feeling that word. And so I was confused. People were, there was no power. There was no, no authority. People just, nothing but wretched sinners waiting to go to heaven someday, making Jesus a fire escape. We got people saved by fear. You know, I, the first message I heard that petrified me so much pastor came in to our high school and he said, listen, if you leave the building right now and you get hit by a bus, it was never a small, like, bug. It was always a double-decker, horrifying death. We need to scare the, literally the hell out of them. I'm not cussing. Literally. To get them saved, it's not saved by fear, but saved by grace. It's his goodness, in Romans it says, his goodness that draws us to him. But I was petrified and I saw kids run to the altar because they were scared and Jesus was the way out rather than the way in oh if we could just see him for who he is everything will change so I had this encounter where for so long I lived knowing the truth I lived in a place of I knew this word because I'd never heard anything else I could quote scripture, I could talk about it, but there was no experience in my life. Hypocritical Christian. If you're a youth, listen closely. I went to high school, I did stupid things, and then I'd go on church. We had church Saturday nights, and I lift my hands in worship and act like all's okay. Listen, how much darker is that darkness knowing the truth? You will stand before him, and it's not a fear thing, but you will stand before him. And you will answer for your life. I promise. So I lived in this hypocritical life and even preached, talking, proclaiming a, a gospel I thought I knew, telling people who they were in Christ, but yet my life still had the world in it. One foot in, one foot out. That's called demonic. That's called lukewarm, and he spits it out hypocritical, going after my own desires, never being aware of him, never going after him. And slowly things changed, but you know, something happened to me and it might, it might seem intense that it was so, so recent. But you know, things changed in my life and I committed myself to righteousness and holiness a couple years back and everything changed. But up to the point, hypocrite, encountered God actually in a, I was a car salesman in a dealership and I realized that my life, I, was, I had a ministry in California and was preaching a gospel that I never lived out and was convicted. I committed my life to God and all over again. This is some years back and I was working at a car dealership. I realized that I'd heard my whole life, Christ in me is the hope of glory, but I realized that, that Christ in me, the hope of glory, will always be a hope if I never let him out. So I made a commitment to God that, God, I'm going to reveal you every day for the rest of my life to at least one person. And I started just saying, hey, Jesus loves you to people. And I started seeing some crazy stuff happen. And I was scared. I didn't understand it. I started hearing God's voice for the first time in my life, but I was a preacher. <laughs> Imagine that. He would come as a thought. The Bible says that we've been given the mind of Christ which means that if I have his mind, then my thoughts must be his thoughts. And the only way I'm gonna know if it's his thought or a lying thought is I have to step out on the thought. So God will speak to me about someone and the only way I'm gonna know if it's him is I've gotta step out and approach that someone. So I would start getting these thoughts out of nowhere about a woman with, you know, you have a problem in, in your appendix and I would just, hey, and, and it was childlike. I'm, I'm a pastor and I'm saying things like, hey, I'm, I'm learning the voice of the Lord. They thought it was really weird. Do you have a problem in your appendix? Yes, no way. <laughs> and see people healed in the showroom of a dealership. I'd be in cars with people and hear God tell me they can't get out of the car. What else are you going to talk about? Stop trying to sell them a car and just give them me. 
You know, I think so often we try to sell people our fruit rather than just let them pick it. So I'm in the car and I'm trying to like sell people cars rather than just talk about the one that I love. And, you know, as I talk more about Jesus, my sales did go down. It's not like this great story of I became the best in the... No, I just had zero desire to sell cars. But you know what started happening in that season? My wife and I, we were... At the time, we were engaged, and I got a ring way more than I can afford because she's worth it. People call that, oh, that's not wisdom. No, I love my wife, and I want the best for her. That messes with people's minds. Budgeting, I get it, but like, I want what's best. If he gave me the best, I ought to give my best. So during that season, I would like have, you know, in the car business, when you don't sell, you get minimum wage. And you get frowned upon by your boss, but I'm not living for my boss anymore. I really got free in that season. And I, I remember like never selling anything and people would send us checks in the mail and say, I had a dream about you. I'm like, what? I was actually just living onto the Lord for the first time in my life in word and in deed, not just talking about him, but actually doing the stuff that looks like him. And I remember one specific testimony that rocked my life is I was... I was sitting at my desk and this lady walked in. She looked like my grandmother because I'm Middle Eastern and, and I was just drawn to her. She just, I felt like God said, go pray for her. And this thought came in. So I walked up to her and I actually had a friend with me that went to Bethel Supernatural School of Ministry that worked with me. And I said, bro, let's go pray for her. He said, hey, I feel the same thing. So we walked over to this lady and the minute we got to this lady and she saw us, she fell on her knees and started screaming and crying in tongues. And I'm like, what's happening? No grid for it whatsoever. Screaming on the ground, in, on her knees, in the showroom of a dealership. I have no idea what's going on. I just approached her. And so I, I tried to kind of get in a thing of like, what's going on? And she said, no, 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 you don't understand. She said, last night I had a dream. And at this point, my general manager had come over too. So there was three of us. God bless. That was... Yeah, so he's there, but this man's a Christian, and he loved the fact that I stepped out, but the big boss in his office is Catholic, and I hear there's a lot of them here, and guess what? Mary didn't die for your sin. Jesus did. You know what Mary says? The last thing she says is whatever he, does, whatever he says, do it. If you encounter someone that's Catholic, tell them, hey, you know what the last words we see in Scripture that Mary says? Whatever Jesus says, do it. <laughs> So I'm, my Catholic boss in there, and I'm actually like, Lord, just seal the room, because I will get fired for this. <laughs> so the lady starts telling us that the night before she had a dream, and in the dream, the Lord spoke to her because she was a Muslim that just gave her life to Jesus. And the Lord spoke to her and said, I want you to go to this dealership, and he showed her the dealership in the dream, she, and he said, to her, I want you to go to that dealership, sell your car, take the money, go back to Syria and win your whole family. So she came and she said she walked into the dream. In the dream, she walked in and it looked exactly like what she saw. She said three men approached her in the dream. And, and in my culture, in the Middle Eastern culture, it's not within the culture for a man to approach a woman and lay hands on her or pray for her. It's not within the culture. So in the dream, she's going, God, I don't know who these strange men are. And it's just, I don't, I don't need them to pray for me. She's almost arguing with God in the dream. And in the dream, God says to her, it's okay, they're my angels. And I said, he said that about me, and I lose it. Shh, this lady ends up praying for me. <laughs> Powerhouse little Middle Eastern lady. Praying for my friend, praying for my GM. And then my boss comes out, and I'm like, it's done, it's over. I'm losing my job. I really... Lord, I did what you wanted me to do here. Praise the Lord. He gets hit with the power of God. She takes oil out of her purse, just like my grandmother. They always have oil. They anoint everything in the house. Takes oil out of her purse, starts anointing people in the showroom, anointing everything in there, and it's, there's a service happening in the showroom of the dealership. My boss is so touched buys her car for more than it's worth, and then gives her an extra $5,000 to go back to Syria to win her family. Wow. 
So we don't, we don't think to ourselves like, what? what if I never walked up? Like, what if I didn't actually steward his voice? He's a whispering shepherd. But we don't hear him because we're so busy and clouded. You know why he's a whispering shepherd? Because he wants us to be close enough to hear him. So I started seeing all these encounters and all these things happen, yet it just became about the outreach. I started seeing people healed. I started getting words of knowledge easy. If you've never had a word of knowledge, it's just simply God can speak to us through his word. He can speak through us audibly. He can. And he can come in a thought, and you have to step out on it to learn his voice. But it, for me, it started becoming about I would go home and I would realize, man, I only prayed for one person today and condemnation came in because I was putting all my identity in gifts like you've been talking about. And there's a verse that says, you know, some will stand before me and they say, you healed the sick in my name, you raised the dead, you cast out devils in my name, but you never knew me. And it convicted my heart because I realized that I was good at working for God, but I did not know God. I was nothing more than an employee working for a boss and he doesn't want employees, he wants children. So some time went by and I remember I'm, I'm still preaching. I'm still going after it. I'm, I'm hungry for God. I really honestly was, but I said, God, I need to know what it looks like in secret when it's just you and me. When, like, what would it look like if I saw someone healed and didn't tell anyone about it but had a secret history with you? And I said, Father, did you see it today? And he just hit Gabriel and Michael and said, do you see what he did? Do you see how he stepped out for me? Yeah, sure, he got it wrong. Yeah, sure, they didn't get healed, but he did it. Like, how far will your love go? Like, tomorrow when you pray for someone and God forbid it doesn't happen because he died, so it always happens. He did. So there's no excuse for you. There's no excuse for me when I pray for the sick and don't see the sick recover. We come up with doctrine, we come up with theology, but there's no theology. Jesus is perfect theology. And every single one that Jesus prayed for was healed. Every one. Every single person Jesus encountered was free. Every single one. One, and if he lives in me, and as he is, so am I, then it must, it must happen. And until I see it, I'm going to go after it. And if I don't see it, I'm not going to give excuses for myself. I'm going to die to myself so he becomes more alive. But I started putting all my identity in it. I started putting all my identity. When it didn't happen, I thought God wasn't pleased with me. You have to know this before we step out tomorrow. Because it's all about getting close to him. But we get close to people instead. In the name of Jesus, but we don't even know him. So God led me to Psalms 91. And I'm going to just read it really quick. Can I get keys again? I'm almost done. Thank you. <laughs> I did say that, didn't I? That we shouldn't be in a hurry, but I do want to honor the time. <laughs> that I was given. So I remember, I'm just going to share a quick testimony, and this is where I'm going to finish. I was in, I was driving home from work. This is in December 2017, very, very recent. Before this, I was hungry for God. I was preaching, and I just, but yet there was an encounter that I yet to have that I was hungry for. I remember I was driving home from my boss's house, and I was Asking God in my car, Lord, I, I started realizing that like I've only ever gone to you for what I can get from you. And I got real honest and vulnerable with God. And I said, God, I've seen so many things. I've preached so many times. I mean, I've seen some crazy stuff at a young age. I've gotten up and seen people fall in a wave, and I didn't even say anything. Like the sovereignty and beauty of Jesus was just faithful, and I didn't even know what was going on seen some really intense miracles and I've seen tumors fall off people's bodies and people walk for the first time. I've seen it all. I've never known anything else. That stuff was normal to me growing up. But I didn't know him and I was hungry to know him and I remember I'm sitting in my car and, and I'm saying, God, I've, I've gone to the secret place but I've, I've never gone there for you. I've always gone there for me. I had this like epiphany of like, it's just been about me. It's been about me getting some power from you and, 
And I would pray things like, God, help me be a better witness. And it's the right prayer, but what's the motive behind it? Help me, God, do this for you. He doesn't need help to do something for you. It's just, he just wants you. So I was doing the works of ministry without knowing that it's about him first before I can work out ministry. So I said, God, I need you to show me how to talk to you in the secret place. I said, God, I need to know, this is gonna sound like kind of intimate, but it is because it's intimacy. I said, I need to know how you like me to be positioned, how you want me to talk, what you want me to say. How can I talk in a way that pleases your heart? How can I minister to your heart? And I had no grid. I just, that was what was in my heart. And I heard God say, William, now you're asking me the right questions. And as God is my witness, I'm at a red light. I remember the street legacy. I'm at a red light and I felt people get weird with this stuff. But listen, if it's not skin on skin, what is it? I believe that God wants to encounter us. I believe that God wants to touch us. I'm gonna talk a little bit about it on Saturday night, just my encounter with the Holy Spirit and how it literally lifted me off my feet. There's a place for that, but you have to come up bearing fruit. I felt, tangibly felt, as if God opened up the front door of my car and sat in my front seat, and for the first time in my life, the fear of the Lord hit my heart. I was stuck to the steering wheel, and I didn't even want to look to my right because it was that real for me. It was like all of a sudden, he made residence. Yet, preaching the gospel, praying for the sick, seeing the sick recover, crazy testimonies, healings, writing it down, numbering how many I got in a day so that I could make sure to tell my story one day. I ran home and God led me to Psalms 91 the next day. I woke up at six and I got in his presence and I got on my knees in the room and, and, I, and I was so hungry for how to minister to him. I never in my life, honest to God, heard any message about it yet. I realized that, it's, that it is out there, that there's a place for that, but I had never heard what it means to minister to God. It was something that he planted in my heart. So I went home and the next day I opened the book to, to Psalms 91 and it says this, he who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God in him I will trust. Surely he shall deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the pestilence. He shall cover you with his feathers and under his wings you shall take refuge. His truth shall be your shield and buckler, which means occupy your surroundings. You shall not be afraid of the terror by night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that walks in darkness, nor the destruction that lays waste at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side and ten thousand at your right hand, but you shall, it shall not come near you. And then you go down and it continues to say, because you have made the Lord who is my refuge, even the most high, your dwelling place. Then you get to verse 14 and, you, and, and it answers the why he's gonna do all this for you. And it says, because he has set his love upon me, therefore I will deliver him. Because he has called upon my name, I will answer him. And I heard God tell me, you've never, you've been in ministry, but you've never built a home with me. So I got into what the meaning is and when it says that he will hide us under the shadow of the Almighty. And that word shadow actually means it's the idea of him hovering over you. Now, I know that God's in me, but I believe he's upon me. He's all around me. I couldn't get away if I tried. It says the Holy Spirit came and he rested upon Jesus and he remained upon him. So it literally means that when you find him in the secret place, that he will become a shadow which hovers over you at all times. I would tell you this, that Peter's shadow didn't heal the sick. It was what he was overshadowed by. What if we could be so close to him that when I walk, God's shadow follows me everywhere? God said, you've never built a home with me. And then you see it again. You see it, you see it in Psalms 27. It, it, David says it like this. He says, there's one thing that I seek and I will seek for the, all the days of my life that I may dwell in the house of the Lord. God said, you've never built a home with me. So I said, God, what, how do I build a home with you? And he said, just live in it and never leave. 
We have this idea with outreach that I'm in the temple and then I go out of the temple. There's no such thing in scripture. You live in the temple, you bring the temple with you everywhere that you go. So I'm in my room and I'm like experiencing this fresh revelation and God's speaking to me and he said, you've always left to pray for the sick, but I've never told you to leave the house. If you want me to be a shadow over you, if you want my presence to hover over you and be upon you, more because listen, he's in me for me, but he's upon me for you. He's in me to change my identity. He's in me to change the way I think. You know, Jesus starts his ministry, repent for the kingdom of heaven's at hand. That word repent means to change the way you think for the kingdom of heaven is within reach. It's available for you. He came in me so that I have a different perspective, so that I live by faith and not by sight, so that I go after him, but he came upon me so that everyone I encounter, he can come upon them. It's not like he leaves me. He comes upon me. So I said, God, what does that look like? And he answered immediately and he said, every time you preach the gospel and every single time you pray for the sick, just open the window. And what's happening on the inside is gonna get on everyone on the outside. You know, John G. Lake said it like this. I have one hand on the sick and one hand on the throne. I need you to get the picture. Because I cannot have us going out on outreach tomorrow, leaving the throne room. You bring the throne room with you everywhere you go. You know, listen, the veil was rent in two so that I could walk into the most holy place. In the Old Testament, they went in once a year and they tied a rope with bells on it just in case they died in the glory because the glory kills you, thank God. It does. It'll kill you. It'll take all your issues away and then you'll just bask in new life of glory. But they didn't have resurrection power then, so they really just died. And they'd pull them out. It would be very terrifying to be like, you're next. (laughs) You know what I want now so desperately? I want to walk into the most holy place. I want to sew that veil back together, cut the cord that held me to the past, and just stay there for the rest of my life. Live in the secret place with God. Have a secret history with God. Get up maybe before the sun comes up so I can meet with the sun. If you want to know a secret to Jesus' life, just read the Bible because all he talks about is going away and being with the Father. The crowds came and he ran. In Mark 6, the disciples come to him and they, they start telling him about all these testimonies and things that they did in his name. And you know what Jesus' response is? He says, why don't you get alone for a while? He doesn't even acknowledge the testimonies that they're talking about. Like I would tell you that in churches today, We get up and we share testimonies of all what God did. And I promise you, if we became aware of God being in the room, you know what he'd say most of the time to those that don't know him? Why don't you get alone for a while? Stop talking so much. We're so busy doing the things of God rather than living for God and living unto God. It doesn't say study to preach yourself approved. It says study to show yourself approved unto God. I don't live to show off for people, I live to show myself approved to him. So God said, I want you to just open the window when you pray for the sick. What's happening on the inside is gonna get on those on the outside. And I started seeing it all over scripture. I started reading and seeing that this is what Jesus, this was the secret to the power that he walked in is he just was alone with the father on a constant basis. He was awake before everyone else. They couldn't find him sometimes because he was with the father. And then what he said when he came down is, Bring me to the city, I must preach. It was a must, I have to say something. It wasn't a duty, it was like, you don't understand what just happened. Like I'd love to just be a fly on the wall with Jesus' intimacy with the Father. It was the secret to his life. He snuck away. You know what we do today when the crowds come? We get Instagram out. Pastors, get the cameras, get the cameras so they can see the crowd. Jesus ran. So right after that, everything in my life in the realm of outreach changed. It really wasn't about an outreach anymore. I actually felt like I was bringing Jesus with me everywhere I went because I wasn't leaving the house. And the same day, it was literally in the same hour, I'm in my office and I am realizing for the first time in my life that all he wants is me. He doesn't want what I can give him. He just wants me like The Holy Spirit says that he came to cry back to him. It's just all about 
this. And if I don't have this, I'll never have this. So I remember I, I heard the Lord tell me, in the middle of nowhere, check your mail. And some of you might have heard this testimony. I don't know if you guys show the video. But this, I have to share this because this testimony, I'll share it for the rest of my life. It changed my life. This is back in December of 2017, after God's teaching me to just dwell with him and be with him. And that he'll hover over me when I go up to people and that I'm not gonna go pray for anyone. He's just gonna be there to touch them. And all I am is a hand that he can come through. So I heard in my heart, go check the mail. I, I left my office and I went outside and it was a weird thing. Like that's, that's like really out there, you know? People are like, well, that sounds weird. I check my mail every day, but I don't really because I'm gone a lot. So I just happened to go out this time and as I'm at my mailbox, these two girls are walking down the street I just said, hey, guys, and, and uh, they were trying to sell me something. They said, hey, you know, we want to know what inspires you. And I said, oh, Jesus. They said, no, 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 like what, what, what wakes you up in the morning? And I said, he wakes me up every morning. <laughs> and they thought I was joking around. They thought I was kidding. They thought I was weird. But the world's going to think you're weird. You just got to give up your dignity because it's not a fruit of the Spirit anyways. So, um, I'm just, I want to be a fool for him. If you can't be a fool for him, you don't love him. So I said, listen, you don't have to sell me anything. I'm, I, I just, I'll go inside and get you a check. It was the second time it happened that week that we gave people money at the door. It seems like they find my house and they found the best house because they're not going to get someone cheap. I'm going to give them what I don't have because I didn't earn it in the first place. Hmm. So I go inside and I said, babe, we get to bless someone again. She said, again. And I said, absolutely. And I wrote a check and I went outside and didn't even know what they were selling. I still haven't gotten it, to be honest. I don't even know what it was. And I gave them a check and I gave it to them. And as I'm opening the front door, I hear in my heart that both of them, thought came to my mind that both of them are in abusive relationships. And for the first time in my life, I wasn't concerned about stepping out and saying it. There was nothing in me that made my heart tremble. I felt like for the first time in my life, I was in the safety of my father. Because faith comes by hearing, but if you're not close enough to hear, you're just gonna be operating on something you don't know. You're gonna be practicing God and trying it out and not realizing that he wants to be close enough to where like, what if every time I got a word of knowledge, I knew it was him because I knew his voice. So like for the first time, I knew without a shadow of a doubt it was God. Like I just, I knew it. So I walked outside and I said, hey, before you guys go, the Lord just told me that both of you are in abusive relationships. And one girl that was there lost it. Lost, I'm on my driveway. Lost it, I mean like wailing, I'm concerned. And I thought, okay, that's right. And the other girl kind of just puts her hands over her mouth, her eyes are big and she's thinking what's happening. And I said, talk to me. And she goes, well, you don't understand. She said, I told my friend when you went inside that when we walked up and I saw you at the mailbox, I felt something go through me. And it made me think of this abusive relationship that I'm currently in and I looked at my friend and said, I need to get out of this abusive relationship. And I said, that's, that's the Lord, he loves you. And all, it, I don't know anything about you, but he knows everything and he's just using me to be a mouth to just tell you how much he loves you. And I got more of a word of like her, she's fighting for her youngest son and 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 she was actually fighting for custody of her youngest son. And this is a young girl. And she's been abused in her life and gone through things with men just using her. So I told her who she was and I ministered the gospel to her. And the other girl, and I looked at the other girl and I said, well, what about you? And she said, well, actually I'm a Muslim. And my parents, you know, have abused me in my life. And I thought, man, Jesus is the only way, the only truth and the only life. And I ministered the gospel to her. It wasn't hard. I just talked about a cross. Like there is power in his name. You don't have to muster something up. You don't need to yell. You don't need to say, thus saith the Lord. You just talk and he'll come out. It's so easy. There's no striving when you know him. So I started talking to them. And, and honestly, in my heart was trembling to go back inside and just be with him more. I was in this place of I couldn't get enough of his presence. Like I was, I got more enjoyment for the first time in my life being alone when no one's around 
just loving on him and ministering to him more than being in front of people and delivering some gospel that I don't even know. So God really touched these girls and I said, listen, it'd probably be a good idea. I'm not really into like pressure. I want the love of God to catch people's hearts. They said, listen, even as you walk away, I feel like God just wants you guys to surrender your hearts to him. And the Muslim girl goes, we're gonna do it now. And I'm in my pajama pants on my driveway and I didn't need to be in a building. I didn't need an organ behind me and a choir. Jesus was hovering over me. And these girls got touched and there was no striving involved for the first time in my life. And I realized that it's all found in building a house with him. I'm gonna finish here. You guys can stand. Ezekiel 44, why don't you guys stand? Okay. I, my prayer tonight is that every single one of you go home, put your phone away, Put Instagram down. Stop letting Facebook be your image and let God be your image. Maybe put the TV down. Maybe your favorite show is not as important as he is. If there's anything in your life that takes away time from him, it's you saying no to him. I'm not saying get legalistic, but I am saying he's worth more. I'm saying, what about a binge with Jesus? I'm gonna say that again because that felt good for me. What about a binge for Jesus and not a binge watching my favorite TV show for 16 hours, filling my mind with garbage, living life through people I see on TV rather than living the life of Jesus that's reserved for me? It's what we do. We watch movies because we like their lives and we, you know, we watch, I, I, you know, when I was before Jesus, I, you know, I love Jason Statham movies. I thought he was awesome and he is awesome. And I'm not saying it's bad to watch that stuff, but I like, I'd like get identity out of it. I'd be in my car, I'd be like, I'm like Jason. <laughs> All the guys in here have done it. You want to be like James Bond? I get it. He's an awesome dude. But there's no one greater than him. And that's Jesus, not Jason, <laughs> James Bond. <laughs> The world is gonna come at you. It's gonna try to get identity. It's gonna try to get all it can to get image. It's what the devil's always wanted is image. It's what the world's always wanted is just image. And anything that distracts us from him is getting your image. You know, we go into the secret place today. We put our Bible down. We make sure the coffee's just right. We take a picture of it. Did you read it? Like, it'd be really weird if I took pictures in intimacy with my wife. That would actually be like demonic and evil to put that kind of stuff out there. Like, we go into intimacy with God and it becomes this sensual thing about, you know, what it looks like. We want people to see us there, but we don't even talk to him. You know, in, my, in our generation, and I don't see it as much here, but in our generation, you know, trendiness is the new thing in the church you know, people, you know, got their boots and their pants on and they're men. People looking like, dressing like women and looking like an H&M magazine. And we've made it all about trendiness and we replaced the power of God with being trendy. We're more into our Insta stories than we are the story that'll change your life forever. So tonight, I'm gonna read this. And tonight, I'm going to challenge you to not turn on the TV. Don't turn on the news. There's really good news here. The only thing I get on TV is bad news. Just live in the good news. It'll all be okay. I'm not saying to be disconnected. I'm just saying to be connected. <laughs> because if you can watch the news with the perspective of the good news, you're not going to be accusing people. And, you know, like we watch it and we get angry with people. And like, what, how are you different than the accuser? Like, guess what? Hillary Clinton needs Jesus too. <laughs> and so does Trump. All of them, everyone, like, everyone needs Jesus. Everyone needs him. People are offended by this stuff. Being politically correct in church, like, knock it off. Like, we need to stand for righteousness. But what is your life speaking when no one's looking? What does your life look like when you're at work? 
Does the temple go with you? Are you in the house or are you leaving the house? Getting sucked into what everyone else is talking about, making fun of someone and laughing about it. Like we're really going to dive into that tomorrow. It's going to be amazing. But tonight I would, I would challenge you to put all the distractions aside and say yes to God. Like get on your knees and actually meditate on it before you fall asleep. Because the word of God says that it's a sword that separates spirit from truth. You know what that means? It means that the lie from the truth is found in here. The separation that separates my mind from the lie and the truth is found in here. There's people in here I feel like that are struggling even sleeping at night. Bad thoughts, bad dreams, get into your word. It'll separate the truth from the lie, the spirit from the soul is what it says, soul from spirit. The soul is the realm, the mind, the will of emotions of man. But the spirit of truth lives in you whether you believe it or not. And what the word does is it brings out the truth and separates the lie. So when I'm sleeping, my subconscious will be full of him. That's what the word does. God wants you to run to your knees tonight and come back tomorrow and let's get this thing on. Let's get this thing, let's become revival. I'm telling you, I believe full-heartedly that this place is about to explode in a way like we've never, ever known. I believe that, I, I believe honestly, in the next couple years, this building is gonna be for youth and for school. Because you guys are gonna need a way bigger facility. Because you're gonna have an active church. Psalms 44, and I want you to read it and study it on your own time, but it, it's, the, it's actually talking about like the, the laws of the priesthood and the governing of the priesthood. And I'm just gonna read it as fast as I can. It says, and the Levites who went far from me, it says there's two types of ministries. That's the context. He's talking about two different types of ministries. It says the Levites who went far from me when Israel went astray, who strayed away from me after their idols, they shall bear in their iniquity, yet they shall be ministers in my sanctuary as gatekeepers in the house and ministers of the house. They shall slay the burnt offering and the sacrifice for the people. They shall stand before them to minister to them. But they ministered to them before their idols and caused the house of Israel to fall into iniquity. Therefore, I have raised my hand against them and an oath against them, says the Lord. They shall bear their iniquity and they shall not come near me to minister. It's one type of ministry. They shall not come near me to minister to me as a priest, nor come near any of my holy things, nor into my most holy place, but they shall bear their shame and their abominations which they have committed. So it's saying there's one type of ministry that's for the people. But this ministry, because you are with the people in the midst of their iniquity, in the midst of their idolatry and all their, all their garbage, that your inheritance pretty much is what it's saying will just be them. It'll just be the people. And when we go after people and that's it, our inheritance is more people. And if you're a pastor, you know that with people comes problems. They need to be free. You know, we want to fill our churches and, and all of it. And, it's, and I get it, but, you know, sometimes it's a bigger headache it says there's one type of ministry and it's ministering to them. But then you get to verse 15. It says, but the priests, the Levites, the sons of Zadok who kept charge of my sanctuary when the children of Israel went astray from me, they tended to him. They tended to the father in the midst of the people being astray. They shall come near me to minister to me and they shall stand before me to offer me the fat and the blood, says the Lord. They shall enter my sanctuary and they shall come near my table to minister to me. They shall keep my charge and it shall be that whenever they enter in the courts of the inner court, they shall put on linen and explains kind of the custom that they had to follow. And it says that they will teach, jumping down to verse 23, they will teach my people the difference between the holy and the unholy and cause them to discern between the clean and the unclean. You get to decide in your life, you don't need a pulpit, you don't need a church, you don't need a ministry in your name. You don't need any of it. Whether you believe it or not, the Bible says that we are kings and priests unto God. It says that you are a royal priesthood in the word. It says that you are a witness. It says that we are supposed to disciple nations. Disciple nations. 
So whether you believe it or not, whether you know it or not, when you're at your job, you're in ministry. When you're at school, young people, you're in ministry. Whatever it is that you're doing, if you're in love with God and you claim Christianity, guess what? You're in full-time, full-on ministry. You don't need to be paid by a church to be full-time. There's no such thing as part-time Christianity. No, it doesn't exist. There is only full-time, full-on, full-contact Christianity. At my job, I'm not a businessman. I'm a Christian. But there's two ministries. You can live for people, the opinions of people. You can live to see people healed and that'll become your image and that'll become your identity and that's it. You'll live for prophecy. You'll live for words of knowledge. You'll live for the giftings, but you'll never see love. And like it says in the word that if you have all of the gifts, but yet you have not love, you are nothing. You are an annoying, clashing symbol in people's faces. It's all about Love, and I tell you this, it's more about loving him than it is about loving them. Because when you love him, you can actually love them. But you can't love people unless you first love him. Because then you'll find yourself living for people and the opinions of people and seeing the gifts and seeing it happen rather than just seeing him happen in front of you and loving Jesus in front of people. I want to live a life that's so in awe of him, so fixed on him that when I encounter people, I just bring them into my love relationship. Everyone's invited. So you have one ministry that ministers for people and that's not what we're gonna do this week. But then you have another ministry and it says that these ones will come into my chamber and they'll minister to my heart. I challenge you when you go to stores, let your life minister to his heart. Be a fragrance unto him is what the word says. And when you're a fragrance unto Christ, you become an aroma to everyone else. Oh, if you would just see it. We don't have to strive this week. We don't have to try this week. We can love Jesus this week. And when we love Jesus this week and we're in awe of him and we're in fear of the Lord and in an awe and reverence at the store, it's just going to happen. I promise you. But it's about ministering to him. So I would challenge you, like when's the last time you spent more than 30 minutes with God? As amazing as this man is and as much of a father as he is, he can't have your relationship with God. He can't have your relationship with Jesus. He can't be your revelation. He is a soul watcher, I get it. He is to guard and protect the flock and lead you to Jesus, but key word there, Jesus. True fathers lead people to the Father, and that's what this man is. He's a father. But church is not your savior. Ministry is not your savior. Jesus is the only way, the only truth, and the only life worth living. There's nothing else for you. So I pray for conviction tonight before you close your eyes. I pray that tomorrow, if you have work at seven, get up at five. What would that look like? Like enough is enough. For me, I don't know about you. I'm not gonna live for myself anymore. I'm not gonna live to have a better day. I'm not gonna live church service to church service. I'm gonna become a living word of God. A living epistle every day, everywhere I go because I'm in love with someone. So I challenge you, put your phones away, turn the TV off and get on your knees tonight and watch what God will do in your life starting tomorrow morning. And then get up in the morning and get on your knees and talk to him again. And don't ask him and beg him for things. Just tell him who he is. You know, Moses, I love this story. Moses, it's God comes to Moses and he says, Moses, I'm going to take out all these people. They're complainers and they were, my Lord. If you look at a map, they could have so easily got into the promised land. It was just a quick left, but they went in a circle because they couldn't stop complaining. So he said, I'm done with them. I'm going to get rid of all of them. And you know what Moses does is he reminds God of who God is. What is that relationship? He says, God, but you're long suffering. You're patient. Listen, God, if, they, if you do that, they're going to say that you just brought us out of Egypt to kill us in a wilderness. That's not who you are. Like, imagine that. You have such an intimacy with God that you can actually speak into the heart of the Father. 
Oh my. And it says that Moses prayed on behalf of the people and said, Father, forgive them. And God responds and says, because of you, Moses, I will fill the earth with my glory and forgive them. Like, how does a God go from almighty God because of one man's prayer, go from I'm gonna kill them all to okay, fine. You know what that is? It's a child that knows his daddy. I could get anything I want from my dad when I was little. I'm the youngest of four. And I could sit in his lap, kiss him on the cheek, and I was good to go. And, and he, he couldn't say no. Now listen, it's not something we take advantage of. There needs to be a fear of the Lord. But you don't realize what you are in his heart. You are his kid. You are his child. You know, my son is 14 months, and the first time in my culture we don't say dad, we say bubba. And the first time he said my name, I ran. I wasn't even in the room. He was on his high chair, and he went, bubba. And I took off. Doesn't matter what was going on. The important stuff didn't matter. My son said my name. I would say that the first time that we actually cry out, Abba, Father, he comes running. He can't help himself. You're his child. He loves you. He can't help but to say yes when you give him your yes. Actually, you know what happens is you say yes and he says amen and it's done. Done. If you knew what you carried with God, you would never have a bad day again. (laughs) You'd never get upset again when someone cuts you off. You'd be so in love with God you just can't help but to love him and you'd pray for them. You know, it says, bless those that persecute you. Bless them like it doesn't make sense. Turn the other cheek. We're still stuck in the old covenant. Hmm. So can we make a commitment tonight before we begin this weekend, before we start stepping out and just make a commitment that it's about him? Can we do that together? Like, I would even challenge you, if you are ready To just be done with the norm. Be done with the monotony of life. Be done just doing this church thing and ready to really build a house with God and dive into God. Guys, I'm telling you, I've had encounters with him that I will never tell anyone about when no one's looking that have absolutely transformed my life. I've seen God face to face in such a way that I don't want to see anything else ever again. Don't get into the word to preach a message. Don't get into the word to be able to quote it in front of people. Get in the word and eat it and let it become your life. But how many of you are ready, and if you are, just slip your hand in the air, to actually say yes to God? I mean like really full on. Like done living for myself, done living for people. Actually, if your hand is raised, What you're saying is, God, I'm gonna make a commitment to you that practically every day, I'm not gonna make time for you based on my schedule. I'm gonna base my schedule off of making time for you. So just keep your hands up and if your hand's not up, I guess you got it going and you're amazing and that's awesome. So pray for those that hands are up. Is my hands are up because I need more. I would challenge you, just make a step. This isn't like an emotional thing. I really feel it in my heart. But I just feel like God wants to make us a step and I know it's already 9, 11, but we'll be done right now. I would just like you to come fill the front for the sake of saying, like God, I'm coming to your altar. And if, I know there's not a lot of room, but just even in the aisle, make a step. Make a step. This isn't like my altar call. This is you showing God that things are gonna change. Like really change. You're committing your life. Come on, there's more room over here. Come on, your family, you can be close. It's all right. You're committing that he's worth more than your time. He's worth more than all the other stuff you have going on. You're saying, God, tomorrow, I'm gonna get up early. Practical. Tonight, 
I'm not going to turn on the TV. I'm going to turn on Jesus. I promise that the change that you desire in your life will come so much easier than you think it's going to come. And you know what it is? You know what the secret is? Surrender. So if you have never been born again, or maybe you have been born again, and there's a born again again needed, now is the time because we cannot go out. We cannot go out without being born again again. We cannot go out and put our identity in people and what happens and how God flows through us. God just wants you. So come on, lift your hands if you're ready to be born again, again. If you're ready to be born again for the first time. And if you are born again for the first time, I don't know if new to Jesus is open, but you should find someone in leadership here to get plugged in. Can you just turn that up just a little bit, please? Thank you. Come on, close your eyes. Jesus, we say yes. We are done living our old way. We are done living for ourselves. We are done going to the secret place for ourselves. But we fully commit to you. Come on, I want you to just lift your own yes to God, right where you are. Who cares if the person next to you hears you? Die already and come alive to God. Say yes to God as if it's just you and him in a room. Say yes to God like you mean it. Come on, lift your yes to him so that he can actually come and say amen. Amen, come on. Jesus, we need more. Jesus, we need more. We say yes, God. We say yes, God. We are not satisfied, God. We want more. Come on, lift your yes. Lift your yes. Lift your yes. yes. Come on, Lord. Thank you, God. Thank you, God, for more. I want everyone to repeat this. And if you're already born again, it's okay. Let's just do it again. Say, Father, I give you my life. If necessary, I give it to you all over again. I commit my words and my deeds to fully for the rest of my life be unto you. I say that I'm going to live for you for the rest of my life. God, I believe that when you died, I died with you. I believe that you were raised from the dead and I was raised with you. Come on, say it like you mean it. And I believe that I am now seated in heavenly places. I give you my life. I say yes. Full surrender. All over again. In Jesus' mighty name. Come on, everyone said amen. 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 Thank you so much for joining us today. If God has impacted your life through this message, please join Victory in reaching people all around the world by sowing back into the kingdom today. You can give at rvictory.org slash give or download the Victory Church app and select give. Find Victory on social media for bonus teachings and content all throughout the week. 